be out at 3.45. Is that a question? Um, I don't know. But in any case, so um, we could also continue discussion, I guess, in the lounge outside. If required, so. Should we wait for the mic? Yeah, should we wait for the mic? Oh, for the only we don't need to make like sort of understanding, but if you wanted to, I think the camera needs the camera needs the mic. But so I can start. Well, we, I mean, maybe I can just remind everyone where we were and where we're going. And that doesn't need to be recorded. Um, so because it's been a week. So if you remember, last time I began by uh, just talking about entanglement entropy in general, where it's of interest, where it's used in physics, where it's shown up its origin in relation to black hole entropy, which is still, for me, the uh, most interesting aspect. But for many other people, they not, have no interest in black holes. They're very interested in entanglement entropy. I think in the weeks since we last met, I think I might have gotten at least one and maybe two announcements of seminars that had something to do with entanglement entropy from the condensed matter people. Um, and then I sort of reviewed what was entanglement, just a, just a strict definition of entanglement entropy, and then embarked on a calculation which will allow you to, uh, in principle, compute for any collection, any collection of harmonic oscillators in interaction with each other and in their joint ground state, the entanglement entropy of one subset of the oscillators with respect to the other set of the oscillators. So what I want to do now is to, um, today, well, the rest of the lectures anyway, I don't think we'll get entirely, I know we won't get through it entirely today, but in the rest of the lectures, what I want to do is, first of all, finish the calculation, I sort of briefly mentioned how it comes out in the end, uh, uh, last time, but let me finish the calculation. So I, in all of this, I'll try to be very careful and um, leave nothing out, basically. So everything should be there if you want to go through the derivation yourself. Then, as I said, once you have that formula, you can, in principle, conclude the angle between anything and anything. But probably, the most interesting thing uh, that one learns from that by applying it to different situations is what's called the area law, which is especially in the context of quantum field theory, but also in the context of uh, condensed matter systems, where you don't have a true continuum, that at least when you're in a large enough region compared to the fundamental discreteness scale, or the cutoff that you have to put in in the case of quantum field theory, you find that the entanglement of some region with respect to its complement is to a leading approximation just proportional to the size of the boundary of the region. That's called an area uh, in the case of, because one is thinking in three dimensions, three plus one dimension, but it's sometimes called area, and I'll call it area in general, even if we're in two plus one or one plus one dimension. So it really means just the size of the measure of the boundary of the region. So, that, uh, that's probably the most interesting result, uh, interesting sort of feature of entanglement entropy. And then people uh, more recently have looked at subleading terms and are able to get a lot of information out of that, as I mentioned in connection with the C theorem, for example, which I referred to. So, what I, when I was preparing these, I think I got a better a better understanding of why it's an area of law. And so I want to give you then intuitive understanding and then come back, because I don't want to push that off so it'll get lost at the end of the lectures. I'll try to give the intuitive explanation of the area of law. And then after that, come back and take our exact formula that we have and start applying it to the field theory. Is that simple? Oh, but will that help us? I don't think. Will that help this? It will? Okay. Yeah, but it's not. 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 Ye
uh, sort of near, dearer to my heart because it has a more space-time character as opposed to a pure space and a moment of time character. So as it came up yesterday in the discussion, that uh, more series-like approach. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about that one. I might refer to it once or twice. I'll give you a reference for it. And also, <coughs> interestingly enough, I, I guess Abhishek is not here, but... Oh, he is there. There he is, yeah. So he and a collaborator also derived essentially the equivalent formula just in the context of, uh, what was it, a non-equilibrium, you can say what exactly what it was, but it was a condensed matter system. It's a non-equilibrium system, like a non-equilibrium system where there's a system and a heat path, everything is one because of it. So it's essentially the same mathematical formula. So you can, you can look it up in either of those two places. In, um, I guess if you want to see it in my version, my website, if you just go to my own web page or to the archive, it's called, the, the name of this paper is something like Expressing the Entropy Globally, I forget the rest, <coughs> or something else, in terms of correlation functions or something like that. Your paper, I guess, they can get. Um, is, there some, should, is there something I can write for the reference? Uh, and it says finding uh, the density matrix of. Uh, Maybe asking for the reference. So this is my. Anyway. So that other one, at some point. Uh, I'll come back, to mention it again once more at least, because it, it should in principle be equivalent to the formula. The form, that formula should be <coughs> equivalent to the formula that I will derive. And that, would be, that would be a nice little problem, I think fairly simple, to show the equivalence explicitly. It's her, Saito and Hangi. Sorry? Her, Saito and Hangi. The other name is S-A-I-T-O, Saito and Hangi. S-A-I-T. And Zach Hengi, B T N G D A. Okay. So we'll leave uh, just some general mathematical facts. At this point, well, let's see. Shall I remind? Maybe I should re just remind. You what the formula we had um, arrived at. Uh, I gave you, I already gave you most of the general facts, <coughs> um, but you may have not remembered them. So let me just put this was a fact about block matrices. I won't, re, I won't try and recall all the notation and so on. This is, the A and C are the big indices correspond to label both operators inside and outside. The operators inside are labeled by uh, small Roman letters, the ones outside by small Greek letters, and the capital letters will be the large, uppercase letters will uh, cover both. So this, uh, and then that, so that we had Hopefully you remember the notation. It was M A B minus M twiddle A B is equal to M A L plus M L to theta M theta B um, with a twiddle over the middle one. And where this represents Remember the inverse of the subblock matrix uh, with discrete indices that is in alphabet. So, I mean, that has the extra. I won't repeat. I, I won't repeat all the. Since I guess we're a little rushed. I won't repeat all the definitions. But all all equations of this form, where you raise or lower the indices, are true. And then the other one is more or less immediate just from the definition of inverse, which is M A B M B gamma is equal to minus M 
a beta in Swap, the Greek for the Roman. Um, so that, I think that's what we'll leave for that. Then there was the formulas for the Gaussian integrals, which we used last time. It will be, I don't know if we still need it anymore. I'll write it down. It's, that's, I think, the most familiar one. So an n dimensional Gaussian integral minus x ax plus b x is equal to. Uh, I'll write it down. That's symbolically the determinant of a over pi to the minus one half. <coughs> times the exponent of one quarter g a and b. And then finally there was um, oh just the fact that you could simultaneously I don't have to write it down because it's just a state it's just an assertion that given any two matrices symmetric matrices, one of which is positive definite, you can simultaneously diagnose them. And then the last thing we'll need, well, uh, is the entropy of a thermal, a thermal state of a, of a harmonic oscillator. Um, so where were we? Yeah, so I might as well do that now too. Well, no, let, let me first recall the formula that, we're, that we had arrived at, the halfway point in the calculation. And then we'll recall that. So what we had proven last time was taking the reduced density matrix for the first set of oscillators in the position basis. It, and then, of course, it looks like it's just a matrix that's, whose rows and columns are labeled by this continuous variable Q. Q here is, of course, short for QA, a whole set of Qs. Um, and that, not worrying about the normalization, which we don't, which we can always recover. It's just was given by e to the minus one half m a b times q a q b plus q prime a q prime b minus one quarter. I guess people could see this up here, right? Up? Not this part, actually, the corner. You cannot see this part? No. No. This is is not. Then, um, so minus one quarter of the of other matrix N A B acting on the difference Q minus Q prime A times Q minus Q prime B, where these matrices N and M, maybe I should so M A B is just equal to, M, to W, oh I didn't, I should remind you the definition. It's just the W tilde AD and NAD, <coughs> somewhat more complicated, that has to do with the couplings between, well they both have to do in some ways the coupling between the two, as we'll see, but this one is more implicit. This is explicit WA alpha, which is the off-diagonal part of W of the tilde alpha beta, w beta b. Okay, so that's a review of where we were, where uh, I should remember, I should recall also the definition. Um, we had b a b was just the potential term in the harmonic oscillator, you know, the one that gives you potential energy. Oops. And this W was the square root of the matrix B, where the, where the square root is taken, strictly speaking, with respect to the mass matrix. But quite often the mass matrix is just the identity matrix. Okay, so 
that's where we were. Um, does anyone have any question or what is it clear what anything else that I need to remind everyone about? Okay. So then we need one more. So what we want to do now is we have the reduced density matrix in some form or other, but we, we want to, what we want now, the entanglement entropy that we're after is precisely the Gibbs, Von Neumann, uh, Shannon, whatever you call it, entropy. These infinite matrix. Uh, the, let's think of it for the moment as a finite matrix. Why is it positive? Oh, 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 sorry. V, v, yeah, v is a, let's think of it as fine. When we come to the field theory, it'll become the infinite matrix. Number of points inside and outside the finite. Yeah, well, let's think of it that way for now. Okay. But so, is it, why is it positive? Ah, it's positive, uh, it's positive because the, the, we're interested in a stable kind of, we're interested in something where it has a well defined ground state. So if it we're not positive, it's actually. Yeah, if it's not positive, then there, then if it actually has negative eigenvalues, then you'll have some directions in um, configuration space, you know, which look like an inverted harmonic oscillator, and then it'll be unstable. So there'll be no ground state for that. Or if you if it's it could happen that it was only positive semi-definite. I mean, here it wouldn't be positive in any form at all. Then there would be un just an instability. So no ground state whatsoever. If it was only positive, semi-definite, there could be you know flat directions in the potential, As, and that those would represent those degrees of freedom would act like free particles, and that's probably a more interesting case. But once again, um, it wouldn't really have a ground state because you know a free particle. There's no well-defined normalizable minimum energy state for a free particle. So you so, exclude cases like. Attractive Coulomb plus an appropriate constant. Attractive Coulomb plus an appropriate constant. So it is potentially the uncertainty principle. Well, Coulomb, yes. I, I'm, all, I mean, I'm only limiting myself to harmonic oscillators of so just quadratic couplings. Oh. Just to recall, maybe I should just recall if I can remember the factors that I have. So th this all started from a Lagrangian, which was one half G A B. Uh, Q dot A, Q dot B, minus one half, this is the definition now, that matrix B, Q A. And I think that's how I have the halves. So, um, so that's it. So it's, everything is quadratic. So, so it'll be in the free field case, it'll be in the free field. If you wanted to do a Coulomb interaction, then this calculation wouldn't work because it, you wouldn't have. You see, we've got a Gaussian density matrix, and the remainder of the calculation is going to heavily rest on the fact that it's Gaussian. So you'd have to define um, I mean the definition would still be okay, but you, this calculation wouldn't work anymore. So, so I assume that G and B are positive, definite. And then, and then when I write, I should have said this, or I did say it last time, but it's worth recalling again, that this W is, when I say the square root of G, that means the positive square root of G. Of course, for every eigenvalue, there's going to be a choice of sign in the square root, but we always want to choose the positive square root. So we also assume, since W is the square root of a positive matrix, it's also positive. So all of those are positive definite matrices. So the, the next order of business is to compute the entropy of this sort of a Gaussian density matrix, and we'll be able to compute it in full generality, the Gaussian matrix, density matrix of this form, and then we'll just plug in what M and N are which are these two things, and that'll give us the formula for the entanglement entropy. So that's the plan. So we'll take, and, and to break up the plan a little bit more, we'll, first we'll start with two coupled, I, I mean this is, for, 
and coupled oscillators. Usually coupled, we'll just start with two coupled oscillators, but not in their ground stage. This is just an auxiliary calculation. Two coupled oscillators in the squeeze state. Uh, trace out one, just like before, and then you'll see that the resulting, we'll find that the resulting density matrix for the one that we left behind, uh, didn't trace out, is of this general form. It's just where the index is, uh, is gone. It's um, <coughs> just one degree of freedom. And it'll look thermal, and so we'll be able to get the entropy. We know it's entropy. I'll recall for you in a second the entropy of a thermal state of a single harmonic oscillator. So that'll give us entropy for one degree of freedom. And then using the stack that we can diagonalize these matrices, that'll immediately give us the entropy for many. So that'll give us the entropy for this, let's call it sharp, for this, um, this, this, this general class of density matrices. And then plugging in, that'll give us the entropy, the entanglement entropy for row of the Row sub 1, as I called it. Okay. So that's the plan of action. And this, that last thing will be the main result, uh, from a technical point of view, of this, except for the, uh, the later application to the, uh, the quantum field theory. The main general result will be that. So in this step, we'll need to know the entropy of, some of the thermal state of the harmonic oscillator. So let me remind you that's probably in every textbook, or at least every other textbook of, of quantum mechanics. It talks about the origin of quantum mechanics. So let's recall the thermal state of a simple harmonic oscillator an oscillator at temperature T. So, so it's just the bulk, there's nothing really quantum about it except the discreteness of the energy levels. But remember that the probability of being, of course it's a, it's a sequence of, I mean, it's a spectrum like this, labeled by an occupation number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is N. The ground state is N equals 0. And so, it's just the both the relative probability between one level and the next is just given by the both one factor, which is e to the minus beta omega m. Or, I mean, it's e to the minus beta omega, and therefore the probability of the nth level is e to the minus beta omega times n, which I'll write. Uh, normal, I'll get. I'll make the definition that mu is equal to e to the minus beta omega. But mu is the ratio of the probabilities of successive states. And then the, you can easily compute, but it's trivial almost, that the, so the activation probability uh, of the nth level is just mu to the n times some normalization, and that's to make the that up to 1, all the probabilities that has to be 1 minus mu. Okay. So that's, so it's a mixed state, it's a Gaussian, it turns out that it's actually a Gaussian state, as we'll see indirectly, um, but it's a mixed state, so it's an incoherent superposition of the ground state, the first excited state, the second excited state, with these probabilities. And, the, and so what's, and what is the entropy of that? Uh, it can be written in different forms. Oh, sorry. Let's remember that the entropy is equal to, well, I'll write it like this first. Um, it's, this is just the standard ubiquitous entropy form, the sum of p log p inverse, which you can think of as, if you think of pn as itself as a random variable, then it's just the expectation value of the log, I mean, if you look here, then anything you put after that, this sum represents the expectation value of that one of those parts. And so this is just the expectation value of minus log pn, and you can compute what that is. It's so simple that maybe I'll do it, although, as I said, it's, not, it's almost impossible not to find the reference 
wherever you look. And it can be written in this, this is one form of idea. One 